Is all that we see but a dream within a dream? How do we exactly perceive the reality that is before our eyes? How much or how little has to change before our perception is completely betrayed and we have to start anew with a new reality altogether? Such are the questions that we are faced with in tonight's stories. A selection from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so I could read the stories that you share with me. Well, my dear friends, we've reached another midweek, so you all deserve once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I'm writing this by the light of my torch. I'm praying to a god I don't believe in, but it'll somehow save me. My name is John Chester. I'm 19 years old and got into urban exploration a year ago with a friend of mine. His name is Graham Cuddington, and if anyone finds him, then, for the love of God, kick him in the balls and tell him to come find me. I'd hope that, given where this notebook should be found, you might be able to help me, but honestly, I'm losing hope in any idea of that. This place doesn't seem to exactly play by the usual rules of life. Graham messaged me a couple of days ago, at least I think it was. I'm losing a chunk of time down here. My watch stopped being reliable pretty quickly, and my phones died almost as soon as I re realized, well, well, we'll get to that. Best to keep things in line. Anyway, he messaged me with a link to a Google Maps location labeled Ford Tunnel, a train tunnel out in the English countryside that runs beneath a decent-sized hill. A case of cheaper to go through than around, I guess. Oh, he just sent me the link, as well as the message. Interested? Seems pretty unheard of. Well, obviously, I was. That adrenaline rush you get from exploring these old places is unique to being shit-scared and excited. <laughs> How could I refuse? A message back immediately, confirming my enthusiasm before looking up the place to find... Well, nothing didn't come up at all as the place I was looking for, and when I look back, I quickly guess why. It was in the middle of a literally nowhere. Closest village was over ten miles away, and the road alongside it looked like the textbook definition of a country lane. But again, yeah, perfect. It meant nobody had probably even been there in who knew how long, and Graham and I were always in it for the scare. After a little more back and forth, we arranged to meet up there a week from then. He'd recently started attending university, so it wasn't uncommon for us to both head there separately. Now, strange as it might sound, one of the few times we got to catch up recently was while creeping through the gutted halls of an abandoned building. Was it weird? Yes, but uh, we'd never been exactly normal, and it was always a good time to be had. So. After arrangements were made and I'd fueled up my car, I headed out around 1pm on the Saturday of the 21st of October. I still remember how cold it was outside that night, and I regretted not bringing a thicker jacket. But after the hour and a half drive, and getting lost more than a couple of times on the way, I was more than happy to cut my losses and trek out towards the unassuming hill in the field. There, on its western end, was the gaping mouth of the tunnel. Its arch of weather-worn stone brick bordering the gaping black, and standing before it, Graham, his rust-coloured beard and bright blue eyes speaking to his Irish ancestry with the subtlety of a bull in a china shop. We greeted each other with a terse hug and exchanged words, myself of how his beard was getting rough, and him calling on the ongoing joke of how my baby face failed to produce anything more than teen fuzz. Well, I missed him a lot. Tex could only really do so much to abate the feeling of him gone, and it felt good to hear my old friend's voice again without the distortion of a phone speaker. After the regular ritual of psyching ourselves up with the confidence and bravado needed to take on such an outlandish journey through the bowels of the hill, we were off. Within a few minutes of talking each other up and making dares and empty threats of the other being a pussy for life, we began our long walk. 
down the throat of four tunnels. After the reacquaintance, we headed inside and began our personal tour of the old two-track tunnel. We both had our flashlights out within just a few minutes, the thick dust of the place necessitating our breathing masks, the grey snow flowing through the shafts of light cast by our torches, giving the place an otherworldly feel. We scanned around our feet, after realising the futility of trying to pierce the gloom ahead with our hand torches, seeing old dried-up leaf litter and a couple of the crisp packets that seemed to always work their way into any urban environment. It seemed, well, rather routine at first. If it weren't for that oppressive dark and the deafening silence, I'd say it were boring. But for me, in that deathly silence, I have to say I was enraptured. About ten minutes in, I heard Graham speak up in annoyance. Oh, shit. I turned to see what the problem was, watching him rooting through his backpack with a rough speed that speaks to someone looking for something they know they won't find. Torch wedged into his neck, he finally gave in and swung the bag back onto his back. Looking back up at me, Torch aimed at my chest as he spoke with disappointment and annoyance. I think I left the camera in the car. I sighed. The fear wasn't the only thing we loved. Showing off pictures of the creepy places we'd been to was a byproduct of the exploration, and this place was prime to show. We were about fifteen minutes into the tunnel, and looking behind him, I saw that the light from the exit was now barely more than a dim spot. Run back and get it then. I'll wait here till you get back. I told him, as he gave a wry smile guessing that I'd take the time to scare myself shitless in search for the ultimate rush we got to experience so rarely. All right, just don't go to pieces in here. I don't want to come back to a nervous wreck, he warned, both of us aware that, as much as we loved that thrill, there were plenty of times it got to be too much. I waved off his worries, reminding him of times in the past he'd needed taking back from Frozen and Shock himself. He jogged off, calling back that he'd be half an hour at most. I watched him go for about twenty metres, before he became just a bobbing torch beam out in the dust, and I turned away, looking back down at the impenetrable darkness of the tunnel. It only took me about ten minutes to get bored of standing there, listening to the emptiness of the tunnel, before I decided to test the first fun game. Moving my thumb, I found the little rise on my torch with its rough surface that indicated the on-off button. After about a minute's deep breathing and mental preparation, I clicked it in. With a snap, the light flickered out. Standing there, listening to my own breathing, hearing the slight shuffle of my feet on the gravel, I closed my eyes, then opened them noticing that complete absence of any difference in my sight. I did a few more tests, lifting my hand directly before my face, smiling at its failure to appear in my view as I shouted my name into the darkness, hearing it echo back to me before petering out into nothingness, leaving me once again in the void of Ford's tunnels making. It wasn't until I turned around After the initial scare started to wear off and boredom began to settle back in, around the time I began considering turning my torch back on, that I felt a cold wash of fear spill into my stomach and set my hairs on end. Despite not having moved more than maybe a metre, the light at the end of the tunnel was now gone. It was only about four in the afternoon at the latest, and there was no way it had gotten that dark out already. I began to feel myself panic. Lifting my hand, I clicked on the torch, aiming it at my ruggedized watch to see if it had come to a stop. The second hand, still as the grave, I was slowly beginning to think I inhabited. The ground was still there, and the walls to my left and right stood with their gentle curve up overhead. Standing there, 
with my torch illuminating the ceiling, I began to feel the invisible, crushing weight of the hill overhead. Sparking an instant and gripping panic that had me running towards the end of the tunnel, the gravel causing me to stumble a few times as I ran, my torch light shaking with my movement, showing the tunnel around me as if through a stop-motion film. After about five minutes, at the fastest I could trust my legs to carry me, I felt the panic rise again in a cold swell, a kind I can only compare to that of when I realized I couldn't find my mother in a shopping center when I was young. It took a minute of effort to convince myself to stop. Coming to a halt, hands on my knees, doubled over as the adrenaline and fear demanded more oxygen to fuel their fire. Standing there in the dark, I felt more isolated than any of my little experiments in these places had ever managed before. Alone, scared out of my mind, and with no idea of what was going on, I slid down the wall to my left curled into a ball with my arms around my knees, and waited in the dark for what I did not know. I felt the dark's weight crushing in now more than ever. It felt like sitting at the bottom of the deep end of the pool. I could almost feel the pressure against my ears as the heavy silence encroached on the void left by my heavy breaths, slowing to a strangely calm and slow rhythm as I tried desperately to keep myself above my violent mix of emotions. After some time in that dark, maybe five minutes, maybe five hours, I couldn't tell, without the light from my now stowed flashlight, the darkness robbed me even of my ability to tell the passage of time. Eventually, though, I pulled myself together and began to walk slowly along the tunnel's wall, running ideas through my head. Perhaps I'd gotten turn around, and had just ran in deeper. Perhaps there was a cave-in at the end. Maybe this was just all some elaborate prank by Graham. No. All of these seemed unlikely. I'd kept this wall to my right the whole time, until I'd turned around, and Graham wasn't that much of an asshole. Never mind capable of blocking up a whole train tunnel. I'd checked my phone earlier, to find its black glass would only ever greet me with the reflection of my own pale, hollow face, and hand only my own mind to guess at the passage of time now. But at some point, I gave in and sat down again, opening my bag, taking solace in a Kit Kat bar and some sandwiches I'd brought, down in the last of my first water bottle before getting the idea to write this down in my notepad. Hopefully, Someone will find this, eventually, and be able to figure out what happened here in this godforsaken tunnel. I'm going to leave this here, tucked under one of the rails, and hope someone comes across it. For now, I plan to keep walking, and pray to whoever might be listening, I'll find the other end of Ford Tunnel. Please, someone, anyone, Come and find me. I don't want to be lost in the dark like this forever. It all started on a seemingly normal Wednesday afternoon. I'd awaken from my slumber at my usual 4pm. Yes, I know, well, I work late. The night shift can oftentimes be a daunting task. Staying awake tends to be the most difficult assignment I receive. While the rest of the world sleeps, I am awake, lurking about. My job isn't so much important as the events that follow. Well, I arise from my bed, shaken, disoriented, half awake, throwing cold water on my face, readying myself for the day ahead, cooking a nice meal. <laughs> And by cooking, I mean heating up a bowl of Campbell's Chunky Soup. A childhood favourite. Yeah, screw you. I'm an impatient man. And then, visiting my local favourite coffee shop. Arriving at everyone's favourite shot of legal liquid poison. Walking through the front door, I begin scanning the area. There are several young couples seated throughout. A few old bastards reading the newspaper who appear to be barely holding on for dear life. Oh, 
and one gorgeous blonde girl sitting alone. I wasn't necessarily trying to notice her. Rather, she just stands out. <sighs> a complete knockout of a woman. Good God, I've never seen a girl so amazing looking in my life. May I help you, sir? The cashier asks. Huh? Oh, sorry, I was distracted. Yeah, um, let me have a large French vanilla cappuccino with extra sugar and cream. Oh, and can you make it without the French? I ask jokingly. Clearly puzzled and very confused. The young woman looks at me like I'm a homeless man on house arrest. Um, so you don't want the French vanilla? She asks me. Oh, yeah, scratch that. I'll take a coffee. Jet black. Hold the jet, I say, smiling. I can tell her demeanor is changing. She calls over the manager. Just then, a beautiful blonde girl walks up beside me. You'll have what I'm having, she says, grabbing my arm and smiling. She invites me over to chat at her table. I agree and sit across from her. She has this very old book with a worn-out cover and some type of medallion hanging from her necklace. Though, it would have been hard for me to notice any of that, as she has these sharp, deep blue eyes that fit her perfectly and put me in a trance when her eyes meet. It's almost as if I'm under her spell. We begin chatting for a while. At first, it's the usual get-to-know-you kind of questions. And then, out of nowhere, her words hit me hard and ring out like a shotgun blast. This is it. The proposal. So, what if you could buy back your youth? Sell that which you don't need to be young again. To go back in time and live your life all over again and be 30 years younger. Would you do it? She asks very seriously. Looking at her with an interested expression on my face. Well, I suppose it depends what I'd be giving up in return. I respond. Oh, something you wouldn't even miss, she says. Pondering for a moment. Thinking that seemed a bit vague. Is she serious, I wonder? Well, um, if those are your terms, then of course, I say excitedly. She smiles and extends her hand to shake mine. Suddenly, I feel what I could only describe as electricity flowing through my body as our hands touch. And that's the last thing I remember about that day. I wake up yawning and stretching in my really cool blue bar bed that lights up and the tires spin. Uh, wait a minute. Car bed? I look around my room, seeing toys and cartoon posters taped to the walls. God, where am I? I begin looking out of the window. I notice familiar sights. There's a large park across the street, a trampoline and pool in my backyard, a tire swing dangling from a huge tree branch. Oh, I quickly realize I'm now in my childhood home. I grew up in this home, lived here for nearly ten years. Freaking out, I run to the nearest mirror. I can't believe what's staring back at me. A young and innocent five-year-old me. The scars are gone from my face and hands. I had a bad bicycle accident when I was nine. Yeah, thought I was this badass daredevil, flying over wooden ramps, jumping large objects, trying to emulate my childhood hero, Evil Knievel. I begin touching my face where the scars once were. My skin is soft, not yet worn from all the construction work I'd go on to do. Is this real? For some time now, the past had felt like a dream to me, and then suddenly, as not a day has passed, it was back. This must not be a dream, I think to myself. I run back to my bedroom and start playing. Mom? I yell out. She walks in. Yes, Tommy? Is everything all right, my special little boy? She says with a big smile. 
my mom always loved me. She told me daily I was the best thing in the world. She would never let me forget it either. Oh, where's Daddy? Is he at work? Oh, I miss him, I say while playing with toys. Mom walks a few feet to me and leans over, patting me on the head softly, rustling my hair. Oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. God, we go over this every day, don't you remember? Dad died when you were still a baby. He was killed in a drunk driving accident by a semi-truck, she says in a soft, worrisome voice. I look up at her and start crying as I now realize what I've lost. All that I've given just to be young again. If someone ever approaches you with a proposal, don't make the mistake I did. Do not accept. You never know what you'll lose in the end. I stood atop the roof of a skyscraper, watching the fires rage in the city below. My brother stood next to me and watched as the screams of the damned and burning rose into the air, along with the sirens of those trying to preserve this city. Then the planes began passing overhead as the shrill screams of their cargo echoed through the night into the city. With each explosion, our Geiger counter grew more and more restless as I sat down on the edge of the building. So many sacrificed to save the entirety of humanity. So many given unto death so that we may have a chance to continue on. I could feel my skin burning and blistering as the Geiger counter began to sound like Morse code as my brother began to shift in discomfort. From one look on his face, I could see the burden weighing down upon his shoulders. I shared the same burden. The blood that profusely covered his hands also was on mine. So many who have died today. So many more who will die tomorrow because of this. The harsh winter that will fall across the world because this city was burned and made utterly desolate. I look down and I see the crowds of people fleeing the fires, stumbling and tripping over each other and their children in a vain attempt to save themselves. Their screams of agony rising in a sharp crescendo as they are caught in a whirlwind of fire and death. I can feel the skin on my face beginning to peel off as my brother falls onto his side, coughing blood for a few moments before going silent. I close his eyes one last time as I stand at the edge of the building, observing the sacrifice that will save humanity in the end. I look and watch as a small child begins to cry out for their mother, shaking her to no effect before falling over themselves. My legs weaken and I find myself plummeting from the edge of the building and down into the hellish landscape I wrought. Falling. Faster and faster. I find myself before an orb of light in a darkened space. The orb flies around me, inspecting me from head to toe. Finally, a voice echoes from somewhere I cannot see. Why did you do what you did? What justification can you give to the lives you ended prematurely? What gave you the right to destroy the prophecy? I look to the orb with conviction in my voice and nerves of steel. To save humanity from the revelation of their wrongdoing, a sacrifice had to be made. I chose to break the prophecy to give humanity a chance to find their way among the stars. My justification for the blood on mine and my brother's hands is simple. We must sacrifice others and ourselves to save our species, and we shall kneel and make it so. I then looked at the orb, malice growing on my face. You gave us free will, then punished humanity for using it. I sacrificed the city of Schism so that the rest of humanity may have a chance to save itself 
rather than be at the mercy of fickle gods and creatures of the night. I took your feast away from you and left you with table scraps. The orb began to flicker and glow red as the voice bellowed in rage. Then I could feel it again. Falling. Well, a very interesting collection of stories there. Hope they keep you occupied on this winter's evening. <laughs> so thanks to all of you who uh, participated in the poll on the community page on the channel. Um, some suggested reading for you. Well, not reading. Suggested listening, and you seem to have made your choices. So got a lot of longer stories coming up in the next few weeks. A lot for you to enjoy. So thanks for the feedback. Um, I'll keep you posted as and when they're coming up. Until then... You just have to wait until Friday when I will be back with another video for you. Okay, up until then, I don't know what you're going to do. Keep yourselves busy. <laughs> okay, well, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>